coming up on This Week in Radio Tech. Randy Swaffer is with us along with Mike Phillips and Jordan Tuck joins us. We're talking about refurbishing older gear, especially the Duro DAP 310s, uh, the 610s, and transmitter repair and also uh, some of the other things that Jordan Tuck refurbishes. That's all coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio. Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiencies, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support online at Nautel.com. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. It's This Week in Radio Tech. Hi, I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us. I'm in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee, where it's a beautiful day. It's a uh, I don't know about what is this the uh, second day of spring 2024 uh glad you're here it's going to be a good show today unfortunately chris tar is not uh, here today but we have instead of one guest or two guests we have three guests for you on the show today so without a lot of further ado let's jump right in and uh introduce them i, I you know i think suncast may have a four shot uh ready for so you can actually see the, the vast array of, of guests that we have Let's start uh, to my, um, I guess it'd be my left screen right, and that is Jordan Tuck. Hey, Jordan. Good to see you. Glad for Hi, glad everybody. you joined us. Yep. Glad to be and here you again. Sound, <laughs> you sound good. Uh, it's just a DBX mic processor. It's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and that mic, well, is, is that an RE20 or a 27? 320. Oh, 320. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yep. That's the new, it's it's the newer cheaper, one, brethren. A bit less. <laughs> yeah. That's right. All right. Uh, and down below me, Brady Bunch style, this is Randy Swaffer. Hey, Randy, glad you could join us. Good afternoon, Kirk. It's an honor to be on this program. Uh, thank you for joining us. I, I appreciate it. I, I uh, follow you on Facebook and watch your posts, and uh, you've got something to talk about that I didn't know you did until I was reading some of your posts. And diagonally, down there, uh, whoop, wait a minute, <laughs> I guess i got to point that way. There we go. It's Mike Phillips. Hey, Mike, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Kirk. It's been quite a while. It has. It's been it's been way too long. Uh, one time you were on the show because we couldn't find anybody. <laughs> and you well, jumped I figured right that in. was the only so reason that... I was here now. But then I see these smart guys here, so I'm honored. <laughs> well, we got a lot of smart people here on the show. And uh, uh, so on this show, we're going to, to talk with these three guys about the notion of refurbishing older gear. And um, Randy Swaffer has uh, uh, expertise in specifically in refurbishing uh, the Duro DAP audio processors. We're going to talk to Randy about that. But he and Mike uh, Mike Phillips, you know, coordinate on that. Uh, Randy says that Mike's taught him a lot, and uh, Mike says that Randy's taught him a few things. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know who's the teacher and who's the student. Maybe they're both. Uh, but we're going to talk to both of them about refurbishing older gear, especially these beloved uh, Duro DAP 310 audio processors. And then Jordan Tuck is here, and the thing about Jordan is he is uh, he's like a, an an omni refurbisher. He will refurbish anything that's interesting. And so <laughs> we're going to talk to whether it's an audio processor or speakers or audio consoles. Jordan loves those. So we're going to talk to these guys about those things. We're going to jump into it here in just a minute. Uh, I want to uh, first first of all give a quick uh, shout out to Nautel. You know, at the at the NAB that's coming up, Nautel is once again doing the Nautel Users Group Meeting. And it's a little bit different. Every year, Nautel hosts this pre-NAB radio technology forum uh, for their own customers, for colleagues, and for friends. So even if you're not a customer, you can come to this. Uh, they ask, They say, please join us at our 2024 event and listen to notable industry speakers and Nautel personnel as they delve into topics related to broadcast transmission, best practices, uh, challenges, and technology trends. And afterward, you can enjoy networking with your peers during a really delightful lunch. It's a must-attend industry event, and it is free. It's open to anyone passionate about radio transmission. Uh, admittance qualifies for a half credit towards SBE recertification in Category 
H. Now, how do you get involved with the NUG, the Nautel Users Group at NAB, this technology forum? Well, you go to their website and sign up at nautel.com slash NAB slash NUG dash registrations. That's a lot to remember. We'll, um, we'll put that link in the show notes, but you can just go to nautel.com and I think you can probably find your way there. The, uh, the NUG meeting is Sunday, April 14th. That's the same day that the NAB Expo floor does open, and they realize that they're both happening at the same time. Uh, the whole thing goes from 8.30 a.m. until 1 p.m., including lunch. It's at the Flamingo Las Vegas in the Scenic and Twilight Ballrooms. It takes two ballrooms to, to hold all you guys. Uh, there's an industry briefing breakfast at 8.30 to 9.30. The full session is 8.30 to 1.00. And then there's an optional afternoon session, if you want to go to that, about HD Radio 101 and their advanced user interface. Check it out at Nautel.com and register yourself for the NUG at NAB. A lot of folks go there. Uh, I will be there for a little short time. I got to speak there uh, a year or so ago. And uh, anyway, good folks there. Thanks a lot, Nautel, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Okay, we're going to jump into this notion of refurbishing gear. Let me um, let me ask Mike Phillips first, Mike, about the popularity of the Duro DAP 310. This is the classic three-band audio processor that we've seen so many of. Tell me your thoughts ab about that processor and why has it been so popular and why refurbish these things? there but i mean it starts with mike duro invented discriminant audio processing for broadcasting he's the father of it there's no question about it he's my hero and the reason is because i was in the radio business in 1974 75 area i i heard wgar i said how do you do this they told me what it was i had to have one i got one mike helped me get one and i mean it uh it, it just completely changed everything the benefit for anyone who who does I mean most of the people viewing here know exactly what we're talking about i'm assuming but for discriminant audio processing it completely changes everything because in the old days when you had the old cbs volumax automax limiters whatever you had the broadband limiter compressor then whenever you hear a bass drum uh really loud then all of a sudden every time the bass drum hits the cymbals disappear <laughs> And of course, with the discriminant audio processor, the the low band, the mid band, and the high band all attack and release at different times in different ways, and so you get to hear the entire broadband of music, and it it's a complete change. Why Duro? He was first. Of the devices still work. I mean, there uh, there have been certainly more sophisticated units that came out shortly thereafter, and and uh, like people say, they obsoleted the DAP. Well, that's not my experience. I mean, as Randy will tell you, the people who love them, love them, and the people who hate them, they can have other things. It's a free world out there, but they were well done, well designed. They're, they're, with some some exceptions, they're pretty easy to refurbish. It's not real expensive to refurbish one, considering how much they cost brand new, and they can be made to sound just like new. So there's no reason for them to go away. I mean, I've done enough to keep them around for quite a while. Interesting, interesting. And I want to come back to you in, in a minute, Mike, and, and ask you about some of the more, the, uh, more typical things that, that do go wrong. Um, Randy, you've refurbished a number of these, uh, these DAP 310s, uh, and you've been in radio, but you also have uh, another career or a couple careers going on. Uh, and I really enjoy the fact that you tune pianos. That's, that's one of the things that you do. Uh, e even, you know, old timey church pianos that, that haven't been tuned in, in maybe a decade or more, uh, you jump right in and, and tune these things up. Uh, tell me about your experience with the DAP 310 and why you think it sounds good, and what you know? What's your interest in, in these processors? I got exposed to uh, the DAP 310 at WEEN here in Lafayette in the summer of '76. They replaced an aging tube type Collins uh, uh, limiter uh, that had put, been put in the station when it went on the air on November 5th, 1958, and it was just amazing to me because I was a youngster, and I just grew to to love them out of that, and just like what Mike said, uh, the way they would uh, 
keep that bass from knocking a hole in it with a violin or, or cymbals. And it just amazed me. And I started reading and studying everything that Mike DeRose said and uh, the videos. And, and it's, it's, it's just amazing to me uh, the product that he made. And, and uh, Mike told me a while back in communication he had four of them. So I decided I needed at least four of them. <laughs> Uh, is is it true uh, that if you want to do stereo, you would have two of the DAP 310s, right? I I have two in my recording studio hooked up right now doing mm -hmm. just that. Uh, you set them up and balance them, then use that stereo 5-pin uh, DIN plug, and, and, and I've been doing that this week and playing music through it. It's wonderful. Um, Mike... Mike, is it important to, to somehow tie them together if they're operating in stereo on the same program material, but different left and right channels? Is it important? It depends on what your objective is. If you're sitting in the living room mm. listening to it for fun, I don't think it's that big of a deal. But if you're in broadcasting and you're dealing with modulation levels, I think it's probably very important. And, and the good news is that even though that DIN plug is a little hard to find, you can find them. It's not expensive. All it really is doing is connecting four wires from one unit to the next, so it's, and which is ground in the three uh, compressor expanders. So whenever you get action on one channel, it simulates it on the other channel. So again, using our example, let's say you got a badly mixed record that has all the bass drum in the right channel, and uh, and that bass drum is uh, is going to have some effect on even the mid band because it's only 3 dB, 6 dB voltage per octave between the channels, single pole filters on the equalizer card. And so it, the, the, they call it ping ponging. What happens is that you get this reaction to compression on one side. And like if you're listening with headphones and, and, and you don't have this corresponding reaction from the, the, uh, from tying them together, then it kind of feels like your head is ping ponging with these two, uh, Two different reactions. So, I, if a, a professional radio station operation like that definitely should have them uh, tied together. Mike, like I said, I, I want to jump back to you in a second and hear what you think are, are some of the most common problems. Uh, Jordan Tuck is with us. Jordan, you, uh, as I mentioned, you're kind of a, an omni refurb, equal opportunity refurbisher. Uh, you've refurbished yep. a lot of things. Has a, has a DAP three ten been in in uh, in your experience? Nope, I've never seen one. Ah. Not in person. Oh my gosh! Not when I was at Mike's shop. Uh, most of the time, we saw Orban stuff at Mike's, so I've never seen gotcha. one in person. Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, Randy and Mike, we're gonna have to buy Jordan a drink here. She's twenty one now, so <laughs> well, he, he's done things I will never see. be able to touch. <laughs> it's amazing what um, Jordan does. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so Jordan, tell us a bit more about the, the kinds of, uh, what, what's the oldest kind of audio processor that you've, uh, you've worked on? The Max Brothers, probably. I recapped and rebuilt That's a set of those for a friend. Yeah. He uses them in a studio okay. just for an effect. It's not for broadcast use at this point, but, you know, uh, he would smash drum tracks and stuff through it. It's a very fun effect. That's probably the oldest processor that I've dealt with, where a pair of the, it then, was the solid state ones. Ah, uh, so. And then of, of the more modern processors, do you, do, I, I know, I mean, they're, they're, I say more modern. I mean, there's plenty of, of Orb and Optimods that, that, are, that are old. I mean, that are 40 years old now, right? Yeah, still in use most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Wow. There's uh, a few stations uh, Jordan, around here still using 8100s. Oh, yeah, sure. Jordan brought us a bunch of pictures we're going to start looking at uh, in, in a few minutes. Let's run back to, to Mike and, and Randy. M Mike, what, what do you find with a piece of equipment as old as, as a Duro DAP 310, which may in fact be, what, 50 years old at, 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 when you find these things? Yeah. Well, easily, what are I the even... most... Mm -hmm. No, I, I was just going to say, I get some in sometimes that are older than I knew that he was even making them back then. Uh -huh. Um uh, Mike and Kay, two of the not, excuse me, nicest people I've ever met. I'm sure you would agree with yes. that, Kirk. You've met them and Randy as well. Yes. Um, they they have been supportive of what I've tried to do because when I first started doing it, I'm wondering, well, am I, it, it, does he have a repair business? Am I hurting his business? No, they've been very supportive. They've, they've provided me with things at no charge. And if they provide me with something at no charge and uh, I have to put it in a customer's unit, I don't charge the customer for it. So I pass that goodwill along. And I, I think they appreciate that. Um, but what was the question? 
Oh yeah, the the most common if if you get a a, a DAP three ten, yeah, most common issues. What what's first thing is well, it's going to need this, it's going to need that, and then well, we'll see what's wrong with it. Well, let's yeah, and that's right. I mean, and I start immediately. Always replace every electrolytic capacitor in it. Uh, there, there's no question about it. And I would say ninety percent of the ones I replace are good, but some of them have the caps that are blown out of the end of them just because of their age, even on the bypass caps on each individual card. The most problematic uh, issue with a DAP is the edge card connectors where the cards plug into the chassis. And just over the years, those connectors, uh, which is just the fingers on the PC cards that are tin plated, they, um, they, I guess the connectors lose their springiness. And so you have to go in and clean them up. And for some reason, a lot of people have taken soldering irons and built solder up on top of those pins to make them make a better connection with those uh, connectors uh, built into the motherboard. And and I clean all that off, take it all off. I use a, a case of, uh, of Kremlin on each one of them to try to get them as clean as I can. And I think for the most part, um, they work okay. And, I, and I've told Randy, I said, Randy, these things are 50 years old. If you have a problem, try shaking this card, turn the power off, and work it a few times. That's definitely the problem. There are people who are, and, and as you're showing on the screen now, that is the equalizer card. Uh, in fact, that's one I've rebuilt because I'm kind of a stickler on sticking to the way Mike Duro designed it because he got it right. And even though, for example, these, if you look on the left side, these power supply bypass capacitors, they're 250 microfarad capacitors. That's not even a standard value anymore. You could put 1,000 there. You could put 200. It would be fine. But I, I'm just kind of a stick in the milk, and I put back the, the value that was there. I don't want anything to change. I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to change anything. But if you look on the far left side, you see where it plugs into the PC. The PC edge card plugs into the connector on the motherboard, and those pins get they get uh, they they build up a lot of oxidation on the solder and so I clean them up and recommend how to keep them clean and as a general rule I have have really good results with them also looking at that card you will see the rectangular uh film capacitor they never go bad uh I've never found mm-hmm. one I check them they never go bad the other the red capacitors are film bypass capacitors they never go bad but I don't want to talk too much, but I want to point out something on this picture that's up on the screen. Uh, you look at the resistors there, those green resistors, and mm-hmm. those are mill spec resistors. Mike DeRoe would, uh, would source parts from quite a few places. Um, I mean, I think they only made, I, the last number I heard is about 10,000 of these. It may be 20, it may be five, but... Um, but uh, a lot of times when you see them, the parts are different. And that's because he would obviously shop around at various suppliers and get the best parts he could. But many times the parts far exceed the requirement for the design. I mean, they just, that those things just last forever. Um, the other problem you will see is there will often be problems with, you have to find some somewhere. When, I, and when they're shipped to me, I tell people to be very careful to support the meters because if the bezels break, they're going to be broken. You have very limited success putting those back together. Um, I have run into bad op amps, and uh, I've, a lot of times I'll get a board in. Where, you know, probably one of the biggest problems is where people have modified them, and they're convinced that they've got the best solution and the best answer, and I disagree. So I always put them back to stock. In fact, if somebody asked me to modify one, I probably wouldn't do it. So those are the main things I run. I, I guess without a doubt, the number one problem is alignment. The alignment, if you know how to do it, it's like brain surgery. If you know how to do it, it's not tough, but you need to have done it before. You need to understand it. You need to have a distortion analyzer, and um, and and then they can really sound amazing. Does the manual for the DAP310, does it? tell you how to do the alignment or is this something it that does. has to be passed on from one engineer to another? No, it, it does. And in fact, uh, strangely enough, the last manual that was on the Duro.com website, which at this point in time, Randy, I believe is, is down, uh, the, the schematic and I mean, the manual that has the schematics was not complete. So I ultimately uh, put together a complete high quality scan of a manual and 
who is it that's posting schematics? Harold Halakanen, is that his last name? Some Somebody somewhere, mm-hmm. they're out there, but there's some yeah. high quality schematics and it does go into that. Gotcha. Uh, uh, Randy, how about you? If, if you get a DAP 310, you take a look at it. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, the electrical capacitors, that makes sense because, you know, heat and time are not their friends. They're going to dry out over time and they may explode in other ways. Um, what what interesting things have you had to replace on, on a DAP 310, Randy? I can do the simple things and do the op amps and testing and and resistance measurements. And quite frankly, if it, if it gets too far, I, I've sent some several things to Mike and I've uh, private messaged him in the middle of the night about questions. Uh, the, the alignment, I think, is very important. Sometimes they're just not. Hmm. And the bias uh, seemingly is off of that FET. And uh, it, it's, it's, got to, it's got to be set right in order to sound right. And uh, that's the problem I see a lot of times is the alignment. And, uh, and what people do sometimes, as I use the term, when they hot rod those things. And uh, I, I don't know about that. I'd, I'd rather they be stock type items myself. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, before we take a next break, let me ask: uh, Are the meters backlit on, on a proper DAP three hundred and ten? Sort of. There are, not, are sort of. There's some lamps in the bottom of the unit that actually reflect light into them, and ah. those bulbs are now between fifty cents and a buck a piece. I mean, it's mm-hmm. that's not an insignificant cost when you're looking at the number of parts that have to be replaced. But so yes, yes, and no. They're, gotcha. They don't have lamps built into the meters, but they are backlit. Now, I, uh, Jordan, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like uh, on, on some of your projects, uh, have, haven't you replaced uh, incandescent lamps with, with LEDs that, that look really good? Am, am I remembering that right, Jordan? Yes, absolutely. What I'll end up doing oh. a lot of times is I'll go and I'll take these automotive 12-volt uh, LED replacement lamps, and I'll take those apart. And usually they're built into little sections where there's like three LED dies per board. Oh. And then I'll substitute that for the uh, actual incandescent lamp. I did that on the console I'm looking at here. Of course, really? with a dropping okay. resistor. Yeah, the uh, uh, color temp is perfect for something like that. Interesting. So it's, interesting. Like, it's like some off-the-shelf like LED replacement lamp, like batteries and bulbs, the store. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty awesome. I need to do that to these back here. These uh, backlights on these Duros are burned out. So, ah, okay. One of those and, and times I'm, I'll get it. <laughs> and, and I'm, and I'm sure we could have a discussion as to whether, well, do you replace them with the proper incandescent lamp or is an led replacement? If it looks, you know, the same or really close to the same, I've seen led replacements that look just terrible, but I'm sure if, if Jordan yeah. found something that, that works well, then, then it works well. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, it's this week in radio tech. We're talking to Randy, Mike and Jordan about refurbishing gear. And we've got a lot of pictures to come. Uh, from stuff that, that Jordan's been working on, including a transmitter, uh, a really ugly tube, something terrible has gone wrong there, and uh, and some and, and an audio console. We're talking with them about the DAP uh, 310 from Duro and some other projects. I'm Kirk Harnack. Our show is brought to you in part by Broadcast Bionics. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Bionic Studio. The Bionic Studio brings all audience interaction to the fingertips of a production team in radio, TV, and podcast. Our workflow-led system is working 24-7 around the world for small broadcasters and national and international networks. Our telephony module, Bionic Talk Show, allows cost-effective centralization, remote operation, scalability and resilience across an entire network of stations, but at the same time is used in single studio self-op environments. Social media curation and activity is now considered a broadcast critical part of programming. Bionic Social means the studio isn't overwhelmed with a wall of interaction from an ever-growing number of social platforms. We combine SMS, MMS and email together with a speech-to-text service for listeners using smart speakers. We enable studio teams to curate, filter and display all platforms in one place and post text, images and video content to multiple platforms in one operation. Effortless collection of video content with Bionic Director has helped position some of the world's most successful stations as leaders in viral content, generating appointments to listen and free marketing via retweets and shares. 
Bionic Contest enables end-to-end -end tracking of on-air competitions, live reads and prizes. These can be on-air contests, automated SMS entry or online. Anywhere and Skype TX for Radio brings high quality audio and video contribution into the studio with ease. No need for dedicated PCs to run different applications. Everything is controlled within the Bionic Studio UI. And incoming connections are visible to users along with all other platforms. Our codec integration enables connection, algorithm configuration and directory to a wide range of IP and ISDN codecs. The Bionic Studio, a unique suite of products designed to enable your talent to work smarter. And as you know, you can get these different components of the Bionic Studio separately. You can just get what you need, what you want, what's right for your broadcast facility. Bionic, broadcast Bionics, I mean, the, the software and systems they make help you make much better radio, much better content and social media content without really doing anything different than what you're doing now. They just capture what you're doing now. Thanks a lot, Broadcast Bionics, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Hey, I'm Kirk Harnack, along here with uh, Randy Swaffer, Mike Phillips, and Jordan Tuck. Uh, and uh, we're talking about uh, refurbishing stuff. Uh, i tell you what, why don't we uh, take a, uh, a break from the DAP and move over to some of the stuff that Jordan's working on. Uh, all, uh, all of us, uh, Randy and Mike, you're welcome to ask questions and comment as we move along. Uh, Suncast has some photos ready to show. I'm sure there are no particular, what, <laughs> this must be getting it somewhere. Jordan, what's going on here, man? So I had just picked up this console and uh, all I had was my convertible Beetle. And, you know, most people would p take a truck to pick up equipment, but not me, apparently. <laughs> and so that was my, you could see I'm very in-depth in thought right there. I'm wondering how I'm going to get that to fit uh, in the back seat there. And uh, that was the day I was, I was picking up this board and uh, we were just trying to figure out how to make it work. We put the power supply in the trunk and the console in the back seat, and then I took it to work and uh, started the repair process. This one came from WTSQ here in Charleston. It's a low power FM, kind of like a public radio uh, freeform station. It's a fun station to listen to. So it has an interesting history, but yeah, the guy's reaction, they're like, hey, where's your truck? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I pulled up, pulled the top down, and they're like, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> And I didn't Jordan, know you... this picture was taken of me until like months later, they sent it to me. And they're like, oh, by the way, this is what that situation looked like. And you, uh, uh, no, I... I didn't scratch my interior either. I was very careful. That board barely fits. I think it had an inch to spare laying down from the wall uh, to the left side and to the right. It was, uh, it was impressive that it would fit. Now, I'm sure that Randy and Mike and myself, Jordan, you may, may be too young. I, we had those little games that you played as a kid, the little thing where you put the square peg in the square hole and the round peg in the round hole and yep. the star shape. No, I, I and did, that. did you not do that? Of course. <laughs> you did. This was okay. just that on an industrial scale <laughs> or Tetris uh, even. And uh, excuse me for not knowing, I don't know all my competitors' consoles. Which console is that one? That is a Wheatstone. It's an A6000, and it's, I think they produced that from the mid-90s to the early 2000s. There's not very many of them in existence. I would say I, less than 10. Actually, I put in a giant one of those in a recording studio in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, it's, it's actually a studio where William Shatner recorded a lot of the dialogue for Rescue 911 back in the day. Uh, so, yeah, I've, okay, I put one in just, just like that. Maybe, maybe it's as, as big as you could buy. Cool. Okay. <laughs> That's let's really uh, cool. let's let's move on to the next uh, next picture here, Mister Suncast. Oh, here we go, changing gears all together. A transmitter. Yep. So that's Come our eight sixteen. That's a Continental transmitter, and that we have, of course, several of these transmitters in our company. This one is in the building with the studios, and uh, that was right after I had repaired the plate blocker uh, capped on ring around the output tube. Um, oh yeah. It took a direct lightning hit. And it destroyed that capped on ring material. And I've, I've seen them get like pinholes and, you know, cracks before, but this one looked almost uh, shattered. And I think I'd sent a couple of pictures. Of yes. Yeah, Suncast, like, there might but, be a picture of, of that tube with the, uh, with the brown looking plastic ring. There's like a, yeah, it's like a maroon brown insulating material. Yep, yeah. That's there what we the, go. That's what it looks like. 
that's not pretty. It's not supposed to look like that. <laughs> no, and I, I can't say I've ever seen one blown up that badly before, but I'm sure people who are tuned in have probably seen that before. But, you know, I'm just getting started. So, yep. That oh, that's ugly. And, you know, oh, if you that's held ugly. it up to the light, right God. there in the the black, the most black part of it, you could see light through it. And when I took that off, it came off like uh, paint chips, yeah. if you will. Uh, it was very brittle. And oh, I think sure. I just saw a shot of the power supply to the and, console for a second. And, yeah, that was the, yep. the one of the pictures you, you sent me. So that, that's the power supply for the console that was in your little car. Yes, yep. that fit in the trunk, barely. But uh, that thing's the size of a power amplifier. It's the only console that I've ever had that can trip a breaker. Um, the little workshop area in the back of where I work uh, there's enough stuff on that breaker already. And I guess I had pr approached the limit and I went to turn on this console for the first time and uh, everything turned off. <laughs> so um, that was fun trying to figure that out. I thought something was wrong with it, but nope, it's just got, uh, I think there's eight 10,000 microfarad filter caps in the power supply. And it just, it's a huge inrush current. Oh my so, goodness. And that's wow. the room I'm in right now. Wow. Oh, this is where you are now. Okay. Yeah, nice. of course. So, Jordan, how long did it take you to tune that transmitter once you got the Kepton replaced? Not long, maybe five or six minutes. I mean, it literally was right up and running right after that. I, I did have to move the, the shelf inside the tube cavity, so that took a little bit of trial and error. But um, it was the first time that I've had to do that solo, and uh I was very happy with the turnout. I turned it on, it fired right back up. But it was a very intense thunderstorm when that occurred. We actually had uh, significant amounts of water coming down inside the uh, the chimney as well. So that's that's been remedied and fixed. But that was a that was a storm and a half. The reason I wow. ask is that I had a Continental Trans FM transmitter about a hundred years ago <laughs> that the it, it got pinholes in the Kapton. And I was, I'm an AM guy, so I didn't know much about it. And I was lucky enough that I was able to get up with Dave Chenoweth at Continental. You know, do you remember Dave, Kurt? Yes, absolutely. Sure. I mean, this guy's a genius on transmitters. And uh, yes. it, it took literally took six hours to get the plates in tune. And I, I called him after about four hours and said, Dave, either you're lying to me or I'm stupid. And he said, no, Mike, I, I've had your call many, 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 many times. And on that transmitter, you just have to slide the shelf and then test it, slide the shelf and test it, slide the shelf. That's exactly, I mean, exactly what I had to do. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It took me six hours. Wow. wow. I've had to remember um, to take a little Sharpie or something and mark the line where all the, you know, the plates and stuff are. And then when I have to move that tuning shelf, I try to put it back as closely as possible. And that most of the time that works well enough. You know, it, it wouldn't hurt to take a second and explain because there are probably some people watching who don't know what Kapton is or, or why this brown maroon looking stuff is, is there. And Kapton is an insulator. It's a really powerful insulator. Uh, it's thin. And so it lets you build essentially a capacitor that blocks mm -hmm. um, that, that, that allows uh, RF energy to pass while it blocks DC voltage. So you've got an arrangement in these high power tube type FM transmitters where a wire comes down through a, th through a chimney stack and this wire has a very high voltage on it, you know, maybe in, in the range of 5,000 to 12,000 volts, uh, providing the, the supply power for the tube. And so this wire comes down and attaches to the, the top of the tube and that's fine. Uh, now the tube is, uh, is able to be energized with a lot of plate voltage or B plus voltage in the tube. And then, however, the, the tube's going to amplify a, 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 an RF radio frequency signal coming into it, either through the filament structure or through the grid structure. And um, uh, we want to extract that RF power, but that has to go to a place that, uh, that doesn't want the high voltage. So we have to couple, we have to really tightly couple the, the output circuit that wants the RF to go but not let that 10,000 or so volts from the power supply go in that same circuit. And so the Kapton is used to wrap uh, between two pieces of, of metal that are round. So you get a couple of rings of metal and, and it's used between these two. And one of the rings comes right in contact with the tube. 
then you have the 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 um, uh, Kapton, and then the outer conductor of, of this is what goes and takes the RF away. So it doesn't have the DC on it, but it has the high potential RF. Well, the Kapton, uh, you know, some companies have used Teflon, a sheet of Teflon that's wrapped around a couple times. But Kapton, I guess, does a better job. It may maybe more robust uh, and uh, and and puts up and you know and can create a better capacitor than perhaps Teflon can. So there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, some you know, in, at smaller power levels, I've seen them use doorknob capacitors instead of. Uh, of a, a a wrapped you know made capacitor around the tube, so that's what Kapton is. The problem is when it breaks down, you know if the if the electrician decides I'm going through anyway, it's gonna you know muscle through that defensive line of Kapton. Uh, then the Kapton is pretty well screwed, and it's 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 if there's a if there's a hole punctured in it, yeah, the electric electricity is gonna find a way through that hole over and over again, and then it's not gonna not gonna be pretty. How'd I do? Am am, am I a good teacher? I did I teach about Kapton? Glad you cleared that up. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. I've had to replace a lot of it. <laughs> Maybe it's sometimes good, because good I didn't idea. do such a good job wrapping it in the first place. Yeah. Um. All right, uh, uh, Jordan. We got to Well, we let's tell you what we're gonna we're gonna take our our next break. When we get back, uh, we'll have more discussion on the DAP three ten. Also, the DAP six ten. I got introduced to that along with sam phillips and his radio stations but i never had to work on the on the dap 310 or 610 so this is going to be pretty interesting to hear about that and we'll have more pictures from jordan tuck as well this week in radio tech uh comes to you weekly and we enjoy bringing it to you and it's brought to you in part by broadcasters general store and bgs represents just about every line of broadcast equipment you can find one of those is henry engineering now, Hank Landsberg is the proprietor there at Henry Engineering. He designs everything there and a couple of things he's farmed out, some good designs too that he's, he's, he's farmed out. One of those things, though, is the back UPS. And now this is not an entirely unique product category. You can buy devices that do the same thing from other companies, especially from the UPS companies. This one, though, is just is really designed, I think, for the way broadcasters uh, like to work. And it comes to you from Hank Landsberg at Henry Engineering. So you know you know it's well built inside. Now, this isn't meant to run just tons and tons of gear. It's got a 15 amp limit. So you, know, you, you just want to run a few devices off of this. And I use the back UPS at one of my own stations. I need to get it actually for a couple more. I think I said that last time I talk, talked about it. Uh, what it is, it's this automatic switchover, really fast switchover. You, it's got two power inputs. One of them would be from your UPS system that provides you know battery backed up power. The other plug that you put power into it is coming from just your normal uh, power line, your your normal shore power or commercial power, as you might call it. And what this does normally, the power uh, comes from your UPS, uh, and and that's fine. But what happens when you need to take the UPS down? Or what if the UPS does something stupid? And I've had a couple of UPSs do stupid things, like not come back online when they should. And so it's nice to have the ability for this thing to switch you over instantly over to the commercial power input line. That way your gear can keep working. Now, if you're like me, hey, you, maybe you have some gear that has two power supplies, and that's great. One of the power supplies, you plug into a power strip that comes from the UPS, and the other uh, power supply you plug into a strip that just comes from the commercial power or maybe a second UPS. That's up to you. But there's some gear that's pretty important to your operation that may not have two power supplies. So what do you do about those? Well, I have a bunch of those, some uh, some workstations, some on-air stuff, uh, an EAS gear. Um, I have an Omnia 11 that only has one power supply. And so what I do is I plug them into a power strip that's that's powered by the back UPS from and re-engineering. And then it's got two power inputs. So, hey, my UPS can die. I can uh, change the batteries in it. I can fiddle around on the front panel and not worry. I'm going to cut everything off. Because even if I do cut the UPS off, that Henry Engineering snaps right over and provides me with shore power. Also, it has a, a time delay for returning back to UPS power, you know, to make sure your shore power is going to hang on for a uh, for a little while before you, you, you switch back over. So you can get the back UPS from Henry Engineering. You can get it from Broadcaster's General Store. And I tell you, these are great people. You want to buy your gear from them. They have sharp pencils, as I always say. They carry lots of different gear, stuff stuff from, from my uh, employer, Telos Alliance, of course, and lots of other things too. Oh, there'll be the NAB as the sign on the 
uh, on the screen says right now, you can register to get in. Uh, I think they probably have some free passes to the show expo floor. Uh, BGS website is bgs.cc. The phone number is 352-622-7700. Thanks a lot, BGS, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack here along with Jordan Tuck, Mike Phillips, and Randy Swaffer. And uh, let's jump back into the uh, the DAP 310 uh, category before we jump back into into Jordan Tuck's uh, doings. So um, the 310, I, is it true that Mike DeRoe uh, would demo these out of the trunk of his car? He'd drive around with a bunch of them in the trunk and take them to radio stations. Here, try my audio processor. Is that right? I think Randy's talked to him more about that than I have. Randy, what's your story? What do you know about this topic? Uh, he did that. Uh, he was not able, apparently, to get a big uh, big market company to work with him on that. So he, him and Kay would put a half a dozen of them on the kitchen table, uh, build them a line, and he'd take his, leave it said, his hat in his hand, his coat, and take off uh, across the country marketing these things. I, I guess he'd, he'd put them in the air chain, let people hear how they sound, right? Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. I, I want to ask a question while it's on my mind, and yeah. you gentlemen are here. It seemed to me that Mike was not a, a big fan of asymmetrical modulation from what I read. And uh, he says here in, the, in, in this booklet that uh, though your transmitter may be capable of 125% modulation, it's important the difference between the negative and positive peaks be no more than 1 dB apart for better fidelity and substantially lower intermodulation distortion. This means even though the modulation meter will indicate less than 125 in positive peaks, the consistent density from the processor allows greater RMS levels. Uh, the station I was at when I was a kid was a Collins 20V2, and it wasn't capable of, uh, of uh, 125% modulation. And I guess my question to you gentlemen is this, uh, based on what he said, if you set the negative peaks at 95 and, and the positive at uh, 105, et cetera. But, but today with the stuff, especially the things Jordan fools with and these DSP and all these modern processors, is that true anymore? Mm, good question. As far as sound quality issues. I, I don't know, Mike, you have an opinion on that? Well, I mean, if you create a, a asymmetrical, then what Mike says is true, but you got to remember, Mike is a recording engineer. He is all yes. about fidelity. He's not about squeezing the maximum maximum modulation. You said 95 and 105. It's really 99.9999 and yes. 119.99 or 125. I forget what it is. I mean, it's just gone insane. So and, and read in some of the, of the mailing lists and things that we're on. And as a general rule right now, radio sounds terrible. But the, there's this programmer group mentality the group think that if you're uh, half a db lower than your competitor you're not going to have any listeners so we've got to squeeze every little thing out of it randy and i've had this discussion many many times why this why that well i keep going back to mike Duro was a recording engineer he's got some very good credits uh under his name but having said that um i i I totally agree with the first DAP that I had. I, I actually sent Suncast a picture of it. I don't know whether he can pull that up, the one that had the four blocks on it, the two red blocks on it. But um, the when we put it in and look, look at the modulation monitor, it looks terrible. I mean, it looks like, oh, this thing can't be happening. But Duro would always say, but it, you're worried more about density. The loudness is in the density, not in the peak amplitude. And... Um, my experience backs up what he says. Now, I mean, Bob Orban, uh, I've met him a few times. I like him. He's a good guy. He's a brilliant engineer, but he disagreed. He agreed, says that you've got to have the peak, so he would squeeze, cut, and clip and get it all in there. A, a DAP 310 is not a good unit if you are insistent upon having absolute maximum peaks. But I would always challenge you, uh so listen to it. Listen to it on a, a stereo system. Actually, tune it in and and get it tuned up, and you'll see at least what Mike's point is. I I can't disagree with him at all. Uh, the you see at the top of the picture now that's on the screen, the DAP three ten is up at the top. Mm -hmm. um, the picture I sent. I don't know whether you got it. That actually showed the 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 DAP. I have the 
the actual DAP that uh, that I had. There's the six ten. So anyway, uh, oh, you sent it to me. I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't see it to forward oh, to Suncast. It. Okay. I, I'm That's sorry. I, I will. I'll, I'll forward the Suncast, and he, uh, he'll get it pretty soon. It, not Maybe a big deal. Can. I just. It's just. I was curious that um, it, it. What happened is the radio station that we we owned. We sold it in '84, and ultimately, uh, see Randy's six ten there, and um, so we uh, we sold it, and then ultimately they gave me the DAP. They said we don't need this anymore. So I actually have the one that I got directly from Mike Duro in 1974, 75, 76, whatever wow. the year was, and uh, pretty much it hasn't been touched. It's it's still stock, but but I learned some tricks for it. But as far as by the way, it's not just Randy. <laughs> Look at that! <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, this one is special. This is the only DAP of any kind I've never been able to fully repair. Oh? So, yeah, it's got a problem. It's got some digital noise feeding through the analog side of things, and I just haven't figured it out yet. I ultimately, I'm, I've got some things to try. I just haven't gotten back to it yet. Gotcha. But, um, gotcha. But it's, so anyway, the the sound is unique it it was designed to fit a specific purpose it did it it did it well and i will tell you that in i was in the radio business for 22 years See, there you go there you go there There's you go the nice thank you thank oh, you wow. Suncast. yeah the one down at the bottom is the actual yeah. one i got from mike duro that was uh ultimately the one that our radio station and i we at one point were recognized by Broadcasting Magazine as the best sounding small market radio station in the country. How they knew that, I don't know. People would stop by the radio station and say, how do you make this little piece of junk radio station sound like this? And I always told them the truth. I said, you start at the microphone, you clean everything up, you get a, a Duro discriminant audio processor, you tune it up properly and set it up and go. It's, it's really not hard. It just takes a lot of work. So anyway, those are some of the ones that I've, I've repaired and so forth. I, four of them are mine, but uh, the rest of them were, were customer repairs. But uh, so anyway, uh, I've only in my history of the time I was in the radio business, I have only called two radio stations and said, would you tell me what you're doing for audio processing? And both of them told me. The first one was WGAR in Cleveland. You, you no. may have met Robert Raymount, who's passed away now. But he was very helpful. He said, yep, Duro Audio Processor. I said, you make changes to it? Yeah, we made some. We, we changed a few values here and there. And, and I have those values from that unit. And, and uh, I tried them and didn't work for us, but it worked for his transmitter amazingly well. I could talk for an hour on that. And the other was uh, an FM station in Washington, D.C. It was WPGC. And he said, well, oh, we yeah. just got a pair of DAPs. And I said, that's yeah. all I need to know. So Mike Duro got it right. My goodness. It, it just occurred to me that um, my introduction to DAPs was at a couple of stations that Sam Phillips, the guy who discovered Elvis, the guy who started Sun Recording Studio and Phillips Recording Service, that he owned some radio stations in, in Memphis, and I did some engineering um, just after he sold them. So I didn't uh, work for Sam at that station, although I did build a, a station for him. Um, but Sam had uh, DAP 310s. We had two different AM transmitters, one for day, one for night. At different locations actually and then we had uh, a couple of dap 610s on the fm which was an easy listening station so i wonder if you might spend a minute to tell me about the dap 610 it had to be a you know a, a big technology uh, jump from the from the 310 i got to play with it some i actually the first time i saw sam phillips he was sit, he was he i don't know why he mounted them down low in the rack he was laying on his tummy I think he probably had a vodka handy and he was twiddling with the knobs uh, on the 610. That thing is huge, isn't it? it? Well, I mean, it's still in a 19 inch rack, but it's a, yeah. a, a two, two rack unit. Uh, but it's got a lot of parts in it. And it unfortunately, does. They, there is a serious problem with the 610. And I'll just offer this warning for anyone who decides, for example, if they want to ship it or refurbish one. You won't be able to see it on the video, but I'll try to turn it around a little bit. Randy's real, well familiar with what I'm getting ready to talk about. If you look at the the bracket here that holds uh -huh. everything together, this bracket is plastic. That plastic is brittle. These, these standoffs for the circuit board are actually part of this plastic faceplate. 
And when you ship these, if they're not properly packaged, these pieces will break. Mm -hmm. I, I have no way to put them back together. I've patched a few back together. Um, these things, I, I guarantee you, I have, I've never made any money fixing one of them, but I've, I've spent hours and hours going through the book and I think I've got a pretty good handle on them now. Uh, I, I've, I've fixed quite a few of them. They, if, if, by the way, if anybody has one in the rack and they want to take a look at it and when they plug it in, if it blows the fuse, then the problem is shorted, uh, tantalum capacitors on the circuit boards, the, the bypass caps, they, hmm. they, uh, they short and they will take it out. But, but, but they sound great. I mean, they sound terrific and, um, uh, they can be repaired, but they have to be very, very well repaired. I don't have a standard price list. I guess it depends on what it takes. I don't charge enough. Um, but you posted, uh, Suncast posted, uh, my website, dap310.com. <clears throat> like anything else, you can't plan ahead. I call it dap310.com. And then all of a sudden, now we've got to deal with dap610s. So, uh, if you need anything there, you can post comments there and ask questions. There are a couple of guys, Jeff and Bob Hoffman. I mean, there's some people who participate there. And I also have information there on 610s, uh, some of the parts for which are becoming unobtainium. But mm. I love them, and I do it for fun. Uh, I think that, well, I charge a reason, reasonable price for it. Randy's never complained, so uh, I'm going to keep doing it. By the way, in, in terms of refurbishing old equipment, I have started something in the last couple of years ago. I'm now refurbishing ampli tube type amplifiers for uh, Leslie's that work with Hammond organs. Oh my and, goodness! Wow. Oh yeah, yeah, and I'm swamped. Wow. I, 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 yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Randy. The six ten from what I've read and what I've heard, never achieved the popularity of the 310. I think about 3,000 were produced. And uh, it has been stated that a lot of engineers thought the 610 at that time, the 80s, was not aggressive enough. Ah, okay. And you'd have to um, change the firmware to do anything about that. Ah, okay, okay. So it, it was it digitally controlled or was it, uh, what was the basis of its operation? It, it is, it's, it's not, it's digitally controlled analog. Mm -hmm. It has okay. the, the right. I, I'm not sure in, in a short period of time how to describe it, but um, the, the analog path is really pretty pure, which uh, is important. It doesn't uh, digitize the audio to process the audio. It processes the audio based on the audio being digitized and analyzed. Is, Jordan, you might have a better explanation for that than I do. I think your explanation is pretty on point, actually. That kind of reminds me of the audio prisms, I think, are kind of the yeah. same way. But, mm -hmm. yeah, your explanation is better than what I would have said. Yeah. And I, if I recall, the uh, the early Frank Foti processors um, were were that way. They kept the audio as analog, but they, they had a you know, digital control signals. Uh, that would tell the different bands and the overall limiter what to do. Um, Here, so here's that, a little tidbit, Kirk. It might be <laughs> interesting. There's a, a Pam's of Dallas jingle company produced a, a jingle package called Series 49. And for okay. all their packages, they produced a jingle uh, demo. If you can find that, there is actually a music cut on it, called Wayward Son by Kansas, that was processed through a DAP 610. Huh. Um, Okay. Chief engineer at Pam's and I were, were best friends and Mike Duro, <laughs> he loved Mike Duro's stuff too. And they sent us one and we used it to process that audio. A lot of the jingle package would have been processed through it, but Mil Bill Meeks came in and said, nope, 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 nope. So we just did the demo with it. Ah, interesting. Interesting. That, now that brings up an interesting uh, question because, uh, you, you know, Mike Duro had an interest in, in recording studio technology. Uh, several of us do here as well. Um, was, is, is multiband audio processing used very much in the mixing or mastering process? I don't know how to answer that question. I know that a lot of engineers are not in favor of multiband processing because they have control over the individual item. You don't need, I mean, the bass guitar has its own track. The bass drum has its own track. Yeah, so you're yeah, not yeah. going to typically going to do multi-band on the individual tracks. Uh, 
And as to as far as whether uh, in mastering, whether it's being used in mastering, I don't know. I will tell you that there is a really nice multi-band processor in Adobe Audition. And ah. uh, it's being used a lot more than people will admit. Okay. Interesting. Hey, uh, tell you what, I see that we're running short on time. Let's let's jump into a couple more pictures we haven't seen yet uh, from Jordan Tuck's collection. Um, let's see, Suncast, if you got, yeah, who's this and what's he doing? <laughs> that is Mike Erickson. He is, uh, in that picture, he is playing music off of my Rivendell computer, and we were adjusting a couple of uh, Vorsis processors. Those are 31-band FM processors. At least the limiter section is 31 <laughs> bands. Sure. The front yeah, yeah. end is yep. five bands. So yeah. that's, he, he came over and visited for a day. I finally got to meet him after years of, uh, you know, wanting to talk to him and pick his brain about his time at Wheatstone. And uh, it, was a, it was a fun day. And uh, Golden he, he got our FM sounding really processors. good. Yeah, he really knows his stuff when it comes to adjusting these processors. He does. Yeah, he's, he does. he's got the best ears I think I've ever, uh, you know, found on someone else if that makes sense and there's well, and a couple a, of uh, i was gonna say he, he mike erickson has a high degree of passion and interest uh so uh you yes. know, what what he what he develops for people is uh he's, he's good at understanding what what they want to achieve and and helping them get there yep and right there you can see our two vorsis processors the one on the left on the left is for our top 40 station he got that sounding really good and the one he's adjusting in the middle rack there uh, is for a country station and both of them i think just in my opinion in this area are they're the best sounding stations in the area are they the loudest no but they're uh it, I, again i'm not trying to aim for maximum loudness but uh just overall sound quality and cleanliness he achieved it and uh right very thankful that he took it he took some time to come and visit it was fun guys we are we got to take one more quick break uh we're talking to jordan tuck mike phillips and uh, also Randy Swaffer. We're going to have uh, some final words from from each of them. And I got to find out a little bit from from Randy when we come back about how his career in piano tuning, uh, how that informs uh, his his interest in audio processing. That's a, that's a very curious thing for me. Uh, so we'll be right back. Our show is brought to you in part by Angry Audio. And I've mentioned before these uh, headphone amplifiers that Angry Audio makes. It's the headphone gizmo. Uh, right on their website, it, it shows the headphone gizmo. You know, I love this thing. I, I, I usually have one as a prop. It's actually, it's in a suitcase. I haven't taken it back out yet. Uh, but I love this headphone gizmo. In fact, I installed one last summer at uh, my new station in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, the headphone gizmo is plenty loud. Oh, my goodness. This thing will, will get up and jam. It has uh, both sizes of headphone outputs. So it's got the eighth inch and the quarter inch headphone outputs. Uh, of course, the volume control is right there on it. And it can be powered uh, over the Studio Hub connector on the back, which looks like an RJ45, because you know, that's what it is. Uh, or you can power it right there. You can insert power, 16 volts AC, uh, right there on the back of it, as shown. And you can tell it, hey, you're getting powered you know, from uh, the RJ45 connector with the Studio Hub standard, or hey, you're getting powered by the incoming 16 volts. And then it injects the power uh, onto the audio out connector to go power the next one. So you can power, I believe, up to three of these with uh, with a 16 volt AC power supply. Anyway, the the mounting options are quite cool. You can mount this thing upside down, as shown right there under the the console. I put mine a little farther back than is shown here to keep the people with the chair from you know knocking it. <laughs> so that that works out well. And uh, uh, but you can also mount it uh, uh, the other way around. On top of the console, on top of the the countertop, if you'd like to, uh, so clean! Oh my goodness, this thing is just clean as a whistle. What a great design from Angry Audio, the headphone gizmo, and there there's another one. Uh, also, they 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 continue to make the one that Studio Hub made uh, before Angry Audio bought Studio Hub out, and then uh, they also make one called the Guest Gizmo, which also has a, a mute button on it as well as a, a headphone volume control. So they're all from Angry Audio. Check them out. The website is angryaudio.com. Love these guys. Thanks for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Our show is also brought to you by Max Connect. And, you know, they do things we've been talking about, Max Connect Wireless, for years. And lately I've been telling you about the Max Connect U.192. What that is, it's a USB-connected uh, sound card, but it's not your ordinary sound card. 
Uh, it actually does do analog and AES EBU in and out, but it also is exactly perfectly and properly designed to create a multiplex FM signal. It is uh, it, it runs at 192 kilohertz sampling rate, but it also has the right electronics design inside to to output that kind of actually fragile and very precious MPX signal. If you've ever done any research on you know what it takes to properly amplify, transport, move, receive uh, an, an analog MPX signal, that you, you need you need to treat it with care. Uh, otherwise, your FM stereo will be screwed up. Well, the U192 doesn't screw it up. It's just exactly right. In fact, the Max Connect U192 was actually designed by Angry Audio, and they know what they're doing, both in terms of USB and in terms of high sampling rates and proper inputs and outputs. Uh, so if, if you're using one of these or you want to use one of these software FM audio processors, uh, like from Stereo Tool or the Omnia SST, uh, or from uh, from uh, Breakaway, you can use that one, um, and even the uh, the Omnia Nine uh, software version, you can use that one as well. Um, you can use this USB connected sound card to put out your analog signal to go into your FM exciter or your analog uh, FM STL system. It really is the right way to do it. So check it out at MaxConnect.com. I know it's spelled funny: M A X X K O N N E C T because, you know, the internet uh, <laughs> and all the good names are taken. The, all the right way spelling is they're all taken. Check it out. Thanks a lot, Max Connect, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, just a few minutes left. Um, I'd like to get some, well, let's say I, t I said I was going to ask Randall Swaffer. Randall, how is it that, that you tune pianos and, uh, and does this apply well to your interest in audio processing? Yes, I've, al I've always been interested in, in music and uh, I've sung at church and play the piano at church, sung in a couple of quartets. I got out I got out of a job at the age of fifty five that frightened me. And a friend of mine told me, You've got a real good ear listening. Won't you take up tuning pianos? He was going to phase out of it. So I started doing that and I applied myself and learned that A was at four forty hertz and all that uh, technical stuff and and uh I still do. I really enjoy doing that. I enjoy setting them just right where they need to be to sound right. Sometimes they don't stay where I put them, but uh, I do really enjoy <laughs> doing that, Kirk. I've got a lot of connections with people and friends. Uh, I'm a missionary Baptist preacher, and I preach on Sunday or Sunday night nearly every week, and I've got a lot of church connections too. So uh, people have been good to me, and I just enjoy tuning pianos. That's that's awesome. I always like to hear what what people are interested uh, on on the side, what they do. Jordan, you know, you and I haven't got to talk about if you have any uh, hobbies or things that that you know uh, dovetail well with your interest in broadcast engineering and especially equipment refurbishing. Do, do you do something else too? Mm, it's pretty much all just what I do at work. <laughs> I do what yeah. I do at work, and it's the same thing at the house. But uh, um, I love running live sound. I don't know if that. I guess that kind of goes hand in yeah, hand. Yeah, I think that's that pretty cool. And, it, yeah, um, I run sound at my church too, and everybody always compliments the way I do things. And um, I just love audio. I love manipulating it and amplifying it and uh, doing different things to it. So it's a lot of fun. And um, but as far as hobbies, I mean, you see the room I'm in. This is what I do. <laughs> so, yeah, we saw those. Um, we saw those 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 pictures. That those are those are great. Uh, and is, is that at your home? Is that your home studio? Yes, this is our spare bedroom. Oh my! Oh my goodness! Spare bedroom. Oh my. Now it's a studio. <laughs> and we looked at it very briefly, but I understand you have just installed an automation system in that room, right? Yes. Go ahead. It's a uh, Rivendell four point one point oh. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I've I've been trying my hand at that with my friend uh, Chris Hicks at the radio station, and it's a lot of fun. It's very customizable, and sure. um, I just like playing with automation and doing little radio shows and stuff that uh, you know totally aren't being broadcast at all. Um, promise you that. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's a lot of fun. That is that's awesome. I, I it's great that we have this interest. You know, it, it amazes me. And I guess it, it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, I know people uh, who are professional airline pilots, right? They have their, their air transport pilot certificate. They, they fly for the airlines. And when they get home, what do they do? They go get in their little piper. <laughs> they fly around some more. I think, wow. Yep. 
Makes perfect sense. <laughs> and here we are, engineers kind of doing the same thing. Mike Phillips, how about you? What uh, what what kind of tangential things do you do that inform your love of of audio? Well, that's two different questions. Um, I, the the thing I do most interferes with my love of audio, and that's politics, uh, uh -huh. which is all consuming. But uh, I, I get particularly with the rebuilding that I do of the DAPs, the three tens, the six tens, the Leslie amplifiers for Hammond organs. I pretty well get uh, get satisfied. I I, uh, I was going to say something earlier, just to kind of close it out. They, yeah. At some point, you say, uh, it's been a long time, a long time, a long time. In fact, I even think I was looking at some one of uh, Randy's units, and and I got the thing tuned up, and I started sitting there playing with it and set up my sound system to listen to it. And I bet I sat there and listened to it for two hours. It's just such a sweet sound. So I, I pretty well got it made. I've got everything I need with regard to audio. Of course, I've got microphones beyond reason, so... I, I play with all sorts of things, but other than that, I tend to do what everybody else needs me to do. You know, that you bring up a great point. There, There is a pleasure in hearing audio uh, processed well. And I don't mean processed a lot necessarily, but processed well. And and for us engineers, there's, there, there's a joy yep. in experiencing that. Um, exactly. And, and sometimes we listen to audio that's not processed, and it, it sounds a little flat, like, Okay, I could I could pump this up a little bit. Yeah, I can't listen to the program bus on the board. I've got to listen th to it through an air chain. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a problem. It's a real problem. Yes. yes. <laughs> is, is 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 this a a sickness or just something that comes with the job or 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 yeah. are we really right on target? I mean, what about the rest of the population? Do they enjoy listening to well processed audio or not? Kirk, they're listening to MP3s. Well, that's, okay. amen. That's true. Yes yeah. and no. I'd find a lot of people that I talk to about it. They can pick up on the nuances of audio processing. Like if it's more consistent, it's more pleasing to them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Instead of like one song being at one level and then the sweeper comes in and it's super jarring or whatever. Uh, and then if you just have your processing set up correctly and it's all, you know, one homogenized, you know, good, smooth sound, I think they can pick up on that, whether they know what it is or not. I've talked to a lot of people in the I think generally people know what good audio processing is. They just find that there's something about, you know, this TV or radio station that sounds good, I guess. I don't know. Um, I, I've I asked my put wife a, a lot of questions when I set up before. something. Yeah, sorry. I've, I've actually put a DAP yeah. on a TV before. Ah, sure. I had sure. a compeller on my TV for a while. <laughs> it was wideband. It wasn't happening for me. <laughs> it's funny to go it's funny to go watch old newsreels from i don't know the 70s or early 80s and they had this wide band just suck up compression on everything on the news that way nobody had to really you know have their hand on the on the fader controls you know it was just everything was just max loudness all the time uh including all the background the radio stations around here were like that back in the day i listened to old air checks of yeah. radio stations i grew up listening to and it's all it's you know, probably the Max Brothers turned to maximum smoke. So that's probably well, that, what it was that's actually, around here. It's interesting because this is, William, I guess when this, with this, because uh, this is Randy's favorite question, and that is where did all the expander cards go for the DAPs? There's so many, <laughs> so many of these units, but the expander cards are missing. I'm thinking about making one to fit them because a lot of people took the expander cards out of them, and I think that's about 40% of the magic in the doggone things. Wow. Oh my goodness. I just bought one like that. Wow. Oh, I did not know. I'm one of those processors. <laughs> Guys, I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're, we're out of time. I, I see that Suncast has put me on full screen and taken away the four shot. And that means <laughs> uh, Kirk, it's time to go. <laughs> we need to do this again sometime. This is, this is fun. It's yes. interesting. It's, it's a real joy yes, to talk to engineers uh, about audio processing and especially the, the older stuff, stuff that we all, all remember. Except you, Jordan, you're too young. <laughs> I still enjoy it when I see it and hear yeah, it. That's true. That's true. You, do. You, you, you have come yeah. right along with us old guys. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Well, that's a good deal. Now, Kurt, let's be fair. For people who don't know Jordan, this guy has accomplished an um, extreme amount in the years that he's been yes. doing this stuff. He, there's yes, stuff he that he can teach all of us. That, that is true. That, that, and thank you for pointing that out. Amazing. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Thank you for the yeah. kind words. It means a lot. It really does. <laughs> oh.
Well, I would love to have you all back, but right now we got to go. So I appreciate it. Uh, Randy Swaffer's been with us uh, and also Mike Phillips and Jordan Tuck. We appreciate each and every one of you and you watching and listening. We appreciate you as well. Thanks for joining us here on This Week in Radio Tech. And a big thanks to Suncast Quick on the controls to get some pictures on the air, even things we hit them with at the last second. So I appreciate that very much. Uh, tell your friends about uh, about This Week in Radio Tech. If you're watching us on uh, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, uh, please you know like and subscribe. That way you'll be notified when a new one comes along. We do the show live uh, typically on Thursdays at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And then we typically republish the show uh, the next day, you know, with a proper top and tail on it for you know, permanent uh, sitting on, on the Internet. Um, hey, I've got a cool thing to do tomorrow. I'm going to go visit a transmitter site in Huntsville, Alabama, and talk to some engineers about a brand new transmitter that they've installed uh, in, in Huntsville. And they're going to get some good advice and take a, a little tour about that. We'll bring that to you on an upcoming tour. Thanks again for being with us. We'll see you next time on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.